It's been several years since I've done a project with a shallow subwoofer, and there's a reason. It's because I don't like shallow subwoofers. It's my opinion that shallow subwoofers have to make compromises that severely impact performance. And on top of that, people have a tendency to try to cram shallow subwoofers into really tiny boxes. The fact that it's got a shallow mounting depth doesn't change physics. This is a 12 inch subwoofer. It still needs a correctly sized box for a 12 inch subwoofer. And what people tend to do is put these things in tragically undersized enclosures. Don't do that. That's going to hurt your performance. So any shallow subwoofer box is going to be a normally sized box, just shaped odd. They don't actually save space. They save depth. Prodigy reached out to me and said they want to send me a couple of subwoofers and this is one of what they sent. And my first thought was, oh crap, a shallow subwoofer. What am I going to do with this thing? They're either weak and inexpensive or they're over-engineered and expensive. So when you start looking at price and performance, you reach this point where you're just like, I don't even know if I need a subwoofer. Is it really worth the trouble? But this thing is actually priced far too cheap for the way it's built and prices change every day. So I'm not going to tell you the price because you might be watching this video next week or next year, but I'll give you a link down in the video description. There'll be an affiliate link to Sparked Innovations and there's a discount code down there as well. You punch in my coupon code DIY and you can get an additional discount on this thing from Sparked Innovations. Enough yapping, let's design an enclosure. Popping over to the computer, I've gone ahead and dropped the TS parameters into WinISD and I'm gonna show you how this shallow subwoofer models in WinISD. I've decided to go with a 1.5 cubic foot box, not because that's the best size box, but because if you're going to build a shallow subwoofer, it's got to go in a small box. I've gone with a tuning frequency of 36 hertz. And what happens with any subwoofer, as you increase the box size, this green line right over here is going to go up. So you get more output with a bigger box. So you could get louder with a two cubic foot box, but when you consider you're trying to keep this box thin, you run into practical limitations. And I'll show you what I mean, because even though I'm keeping the box really thin, the box is going to turn out kind of big. Let's bring it back down to 1.5 cubic feet. As you tune lower, the green line right down here where it crosses the red line, that's the F3 point. That F3 gets lower as you tune lower. But you'll also notice that hump around 30 or 40 hertz is going to get smaller. So that's the idea. We're trying to balance out output versus low end extension. I'm going to go with the 36 hertz tuning frequency because that seems reasonable given the constraints that we have. Next, we're going to go over here to vents. Right now, this is a four inch round vent. I'm going to actually go with a four by four or square vent. Here's what you want to check next. You go to the top, you pull this drop down menu down and you check out the cone excursion. And here we're going to have a little bit of a problem. The X max on this thing, I think was 11 millimeters and it is going to be exceeding X max at anything below 30 Hertz. That means it's going to go nonlinear and it could begin to distort again, just part of the compromise with a small enclosure. This tells us we're going to have an 18.78 inch long port, which is reasonable. I suppose moving on to the air velocity right up here in the corner it says it's going to peak at 33 hertz and it's going to be 33 meters per second 33 meters per second is too fast it's going to get chuffing but i'm going to flare this port in the final design and the general rule of thumb is you can cut that number in half so we're going to be fine from a chuffing sound quality standpoint before we move on to the next step i want to explain what i mean when i say that this subwoofer is over engineered especially over-engineered for its price point. These are both from Prodigy Audio, and this is the NB2. This is the 12-inch version. It is their entry-level subwoofer. And right here beside it, I've got one of their shallow subwoofers. Look how thin that sucker is. It is also a 12-inch subwoofer, and it is definitely shallow. Now, I was really shocked when I opened this subwoofer up because I looked online and looked at the specs and the prices. Based on the price, I was expecting something less interesting. What I got instead was a subwoofer that really looks like a much more expensive subwoofer. So let's flip it over to the back and check it out. It is a stamped steel basket. And what you'll notice about the basket is it's not set up like a traditional subwoofer. Your traditional subwoofer is like, well, like this traditional subwoofer right here. This is how most subwoofers look. It's a cone. This part right here is the basket. Some people will call it the frame. And inside of the basket, there's this thing down here called the spider. That's the part of the suspension of the subwoofer. So the cone and the spider mount to the frame. And then the magnet, people call this the motor, is going to mount to that frame as well. Now, a lot of thin subwoofers are just 
regular subwoofers like this with a tiny smushed up basket and a little bitty magnet. That is absolutely not what this is. Now a design like this is not entirely uncommon. A lot of subwoofers use a design like this and let me show you how it works. The basket is here and it's really, really shallow. Instead of the basket mounting to the top of the magnet up in here, it mounts to the bottom of the magnet. So the frame kind of wraps around it. Here on the back, there's a massive, massive vent right in the middle. That's the pole vent. And this is a three inch voice coil. A design like this is going to use a bigger voice coil and a bigger diameter magnet in order to get the motor force that it needs to make a lot of bass. Here in this more traditional design where depth's not really a concern, you use a smaller diameter magnet, smaller diameter voice coil, and stack magnets up as long as you want to stack them. Back to the shallow mount subwoofer, you got to have a spot to mount the spider. And if you look inside the frame, there's a little riser right here and the spider is actually mounted to that riser. So the frame wraps around to the back of the magnet, a riser mounts onto the magnet, and the spider is on that riser. There's a lot more weight to it than you would think just by looking at it. So let me grab the scale and show you what I mean. So this is the ND2. I'm getting 14 pounds and a couple of ounces. 14.2, 14.3. As I move the thing around, it changes. So let's take that and put it aside and let's grab the shallow sub. 13 pounds and two ounces. This compact thin subwoofer only weighs about a pound less than this guy. If we look at them side by side, we can definitely tell that the shallow mount has a much larger in diameter magnet. From there, we're heading over to the website DIYAudioGuy.com where I've got a bunch of useful tools such as a bunch of calculators and we're going to use the slot port cut sheet builder. This tool was designed specifically for subwoofer forward, port forward slot ports like you see right here. I'm going to show you a trick. You can easily modify it to make it work because in theory, as long as you made sure you had plenty of room for various clearances and tolerances, you can aim the subwoofer any direction that you want. I know this box is going to be really, really shallow top to bottom, not very tall because it's designed for a thin subwoofer because that's the whole purpose of a thin subwoofer. But because it's not very tall, the box has got to be very, very wide and possibly very, very deep. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna set the enclosure width to 36 inches, that's three feet. I'm gonna set the enclosure height to 5.5 and I've done a little bit of math and that's going to give me enough room for three quarter inch material on the top and the bottom of the box and have four inches of height inside of the box. So there's just enough clearance for this thin subwoofer. Maximum allowed depth. I'm going to plug in 26. That's going to be like the front to back, even though the woofer's firing down and the port width is going to be four inches. I'm shooting for a four inch by four inch port. I did a little bit of planning ahead of time before I used the calculator. Net internal airspace, we're gonna need 1.5 cubic feet. And then there's the subwoofer displacement. The manufacturer says this sub displaces 0.1 cubic feet, but I'm gonna add a little bit of extra displacement on top of that to make it for the fact that I plan on rounding off all my corners. I've got some advanced tools that I can use to make boxes with round corners, and I'm gonna do that because I think they look better and I've got the tools, may as well do it. So we're gonna go here and we're gonna type 0.15. Tuning frequency, 36 hertz. Here's the trick to use this as a down firing ported enclosure builder. Do not hit the double baffle because the baffle is actually firing down and this will put the baffle on the same side of the box as the port. We'll set the subwoofer mounting depth, that is front to back to one inch just to have a number to put in and the cutout to one inch number of subs to one and the outside diameter of the subs to two. And we'll choose the no router cut list. I'm doing it this way because I know I'll have adequate clearance because I've already done some background math. So I know I can kind of enable this to work. I hit generate cut list and it gives me a 36 inch wide enclosure that's going to be front to back 25 inches and then five and a half inches tall. It's actually going to be a bit taller than that because I got to put some feet underneath the enclosure because the subwoofer is firing down and it's going to give me a cut list. And when ISD said my port wall need to be a little bit longer, this is saying 16.25. Why the discrepancy? Why do my calculations come back shorter? This is a slot port enclosure. The port's going to share a wall with one of the sides of the enclosure. When you do that, you've got to make an additional end correction and that end correction is going to be about two inches. Here's a mock-up what that's going to look like in SketchUp. Zooming in, check out the port four inches wide four inches tall this port wall right here is 16 and a quarter inches when you include the baffle it's going to be 17 inches the effective length is going to be 19 inches when ISD said it needs to be 18.78 so we are rounding up to 19 inches so we'll tune just a smidge lower to 36 Hertz when I get done filming I'm going to upload some plans to my website those plans are going to include a regular rectangular version of this box plus plans for a CNC cut version with rounded off 
off corners. I want to recess the subwoofer into the enclosure and to do that I need to cut out an oversized hole in the bottom of the enclosure. The total outside diameter of the subwoofer is 12.25. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger than that to give some wiggle room. So I'm going to make the radius 6.25 and that'll give us a 12 and a half inch cutout and you just use the push pull tool in SketchUp to push that out three quarters of an inch. So now the subwoofer is going to sit up inside the enclosure. Now in order to do that, what I usually do is just double up on the baffle, but airspace is at a premium, so I can't quite double up on that baffle. So I'm going to make another piece and I'm going to move that other piece right into the box like so. It's relatively easy to line up on the screen, but when it comes time to actually do it for real, I'll just go in here and measure this distance. That's four and a quarter. And I'll just use some scrap pieces to line that up before I glue it down. So four and a quarter from the front, four and a quarter from the back. So I'll just put a four and a quarter inch piece of scrap here and down here as well. And then over here as well, nine and three quarters to that distance and five inches there. So a few pieces of scrap and I can center this thing perfectly inside the enclosure. Here's what it's going to look like from the bottom. Nice recess. Now on top of that, I should add some bracing. The idea behind a brace is they're used to cut down those panel resonance. You don't want the box resonating and coloring the sound. Jumping ahead just a little bit, I've added these two pieces here and here. These are risers intended to get the box up off the ground. This is the down firing box and with the sub down firing through this hole right here, if you don't put some spacers or risers of some type, it's going to hit whatever it's laying on the bottom of your car trunk. I made these about an inch and a half tall. Could probably get away with an inch with this particular subwoofer, especially after recessing it three quarters of an inch. While I was putting all that together, I was thinking about the bracing. And what I usually do is add some type of brace like this, not because it's better or worse, but because people like to see this style of brace. A window brace. And I got to thinking that if you're going to make spacers anyway, in order to make sure you have this recess piece right here in the right position inside the enclosure, why not do this right here and just cut those pieces out, make them four inches tall to fit inside the enclosure. And then you can use these as spacers and as braces. What I would recommend that you do is grab a hole saw and cut some three inch holes in these like so, so that you've got some better airflow throughout the enclosure. There we go. Something like this, that will give you some good solid support. You don't have to use as many as I've used. The main thing is that any bracing like this needs to be placed somewhat randomly around the enclosure. The goal of the bracing is to break up panel resonance. If you want to build a box like this for yourself, it'll probably work for several different shallow subwoofers. There's probably enough information in the video for you to back it out and build it if you wanted to. But I've gone ahead and drawn up the plans. They're available inside of my Patreon store. And if you happen to be a $25 and up patron, you have free access to these plans. And as always, I want to give a big shout out to all of my patrons. I couldn't afford to make these videos without their financial support. If you like this kind of content, the best way to ensure that I can keep making it forever would be to head over to Patreon and sign up. $10 and up patrons get their name in the video. $25 and up patrons like Jonathan, Joaquin, JD America, Timothy, and Bo. I'll get a big shout out in the video. Next, I'm going to add a little something extra to these plans because I've got a CNC machine and that allows me to make curves and curves are awesome. Every guy likes curves. So in addition to the regular plans, I'll also have CNC plans available for you along with files that you can use if you happen to use a Shape Oco CNC like the one that I will start off by making some curves. We're going to use the Pi tool. The way this Pi tool works it's pretty straightforward. You click on a spot and move your mouse and I'm going to just type 3.75. So my outer radius is going to be 3.75 and then I just move the cursor until I get to 90 degrees or I can just type in a 90 and hit enter. Then I'm going to grab the whole thing, right click on it and make it a group. Then I'm going to double click on that group so I can modify it and go back to the pie tool. Start off in this corner and make the length of that pie three inches. And we'll go again 90 degrees. And then using the push pull tool, push it down to four inches. And now what that gives us is a three quarter inch thick arc that has a 3.75 inch outer radius and a three inch inner radius. I like doing it this way because it gives me the ability to grab these corners and move these corners wherever I need them. So in this case, I'll put a corner right there. And now I can take these sides, double click on them, then use the push pull tool to join these sides up to these curves. 
Is there more than one way to do this? Absolutely. Is there a better way to do it? I have no idea. This is just the way I like to do it. Now it's just a matter of lather, rinse, repeat, and do all the other ones. Here's what that looks like after I've made all the curves. I've got a curved port here as well, and I've curved the risers. The goal here is to make something that looks like it wasn't designed in Minecraft. What I think would look really good is if I made the top out of a piece of birch plywood, and then maybe used a laser or the CNC to etch a logo, either my logo, or the Prodigy logo into the top of the enclosure. I'll show you how to make that logo and use the CNC software to design this on the next adventure.